But why does Peter rise and run immediately upon hearing that Jesus has been raised from the dead? Why does he rise and run to find Jesus? This morning we're in Luke chapter 24, verse 1 down through verse 12. You know, there's something... There's something about the ending of a movie or the ending of a book. I think everyone in here can relate to this. Something about the ending of a movie, the ending of a book, where you've been following the plot all along and you think you know exactly how it's supposed to end. You have it all played out in your mind. You've set these reasonable expectations. You have reasonable anticipations. And you think it's supposed to end just this way. And then what happens? There's a twist. There's a plot twist, and that plot twist shakes you up because that twist changes everything. And it leaves you stunned. It leaves you shocked. It leaves you marveling at what you've just seen. Because you thought you had it all figured out, but your expectations have been defied. Even more so with God. Greater always are the works of God than the expectations of men. Greater always are the works of God than the expectations of men. What I want you to see from our text this morning is this simple truth, that, that defying all of the expectations of men, Jesus was raised from the dead, and he gives hope to those who have none. Defying all expectations, Jesus was raised from the dead, and he gives hope to those who have none. I'll confess to you this morning that I'm going to be quite animated. Um, I, I can't help being excited about the resurrection. I found it hard to sleep last night and easy to rise this morning just thinking about the resurrection and the opportunity to preach such a text. So if you will, think with me. At the end of Luke 23, Jesus had been crucified. He had been hung there on the cross, humiliated, naked, beaten, scorned, mocked by the very men that he had created, betrayed by one of the twelve, by Judas Iscariot. He had been put to death. He had surrendered his spirit unto God. Into your hands I commit my spirit. And then, by special permission from Pilate, the Roman governor there in Jerusalem and all Judea, okay, Pilate gave special permission to a man named Joseph of Arimathea. And a man also named Nicodemus helped Joseph. And they went... They took it upon themselves to take Jesus' body down off of that cross, his lifeless body. They took it off of the cross, pulling the nails out or pulling his hands and feet off of the nails, and they carted his body off to the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. Jesus was crucified with sinners, crucified with thieves and criminals, yet he was buried in a rich man's tomb. And Joseph of Arimathea placed him in the tomb, and Nicodemus, the Bible tells us that Nicodemus, the one who had came to Jesus by night back in John chapter 3, that Nicodemus had purchased 75 pounds of myrrh and of spices and ointments, and he anointed the body of Jesus as he placed him there in the tomb. And then in order to keep out out thieves and wild animals they took a large stone and they rolled it down into its place over the covering there of the tomb in fact the scribes and the Pharisees had gone to Pilate that evening and they said look we don't want anyone to be deceived that Jesus' body will be stolen by his disciples. And they'll just declare that he's been resurrected so Pilate we want you to set a guard at the tomb so they took a deployment of troops and they set a guard there at the tomb and they put a Roman seal on top of that stone as if that's supposed to stop the works of God. But they put a seal there on that stone, a guard at the tomb, and there Jesus' body lay on the Sabbath day. And it says there at the end of the text, on the Sabbath they rested according to the commandments there at the end of Luke 23. As, G, as God had rested there on the seventh day after he had created the heavens and the earth and all of the creatures and human beings therein, 
God took a rest there on the seventh day. So also he gave man the Sabbath day to commemorate that rest, that on the seventh day we are to rest and we're to take our rest. So the women who had been following Jesus from the beginning, they had been following him from Galilee, remember that they had been there even at the crucifixion. They watched Jesus be crucified, Mary, the mother of Jesus, being one of them. And you remember that Jesus, it's recorded in John's gospel, Jesus looked down at uh, John John the apostle, the disciple whom Jesus, Jesus loved, he looked down at John and he said, Son, behold your mother, and woman, behold your son. And he gave care of his mother Mary. One of the final things he did before his death, he gave care of his mother to the apostle John. And then he breathed out his last, gave his spirit to God. And he died. So these woman, women had seen Jesus crucified. And then as Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus took the body of Jesus and buried him, these women had watched from afar to see what, where he was going to be laid because they had it in their mind that they would come back after the Sabbath day on the first day of the week, that is on Sunday, and they would come and anoint the body of Jesus with spices. And so they went home that evening, on that Friday evening, as the Sabbath was beginning, and they began to prepare all of the spices and myrrh and the ointments that they would take to Jesus' dead body there on Sunday morning. And then they rested on Saturday, waiting for Sunday to come. So it says on verse 24 that while they rested on the Sabbath day, but on the first day of the week, see there's a bit of contrast there. They're going to take their rest on Saturday. They're going to pause like they're supposed to. But when Sunday comes, they're going to get to work. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, and literally there in the Greek, early dawn, you can render that at the deepest dark. If you've ever gone hunting in the morning you've ever gone fishing and you've tried to get out on the water or tried to get to your deer stand, if you're one of those who uses one of those things, if you go out and you are waiting on the sun to come out, you remember, you realize this is going to make you want to go hunt or fish when I say it, but you realize that right before the sun comes up, what happens to the stars? They go dark, don't they? The sky goes absolutely pitch dark. The moon goes dark, the stars go dark, and there's this cold that comes over the land and it kind of just grips you and you know the sun is just moments away from cracking over the horizon there. And as the sun comes up, it'll begin to be light and begin to be warm. There is a deep dark right before the dawn. And so it says that these women, literally, they're going to get up, we would say, at the crack of dawn. They're going to get up at the crack of dawn as early as they possibly can. They have waited the entire Sabbath day to do the work that they're going to do. They're going to get up early and they're going to go do as much as they could possibly do there at the tomb of Jesus, taking care of the body of Jesus. In fact, in John's gospel, it says that while it was still dark, they got up and they were going to go and anoint the body of Jesus. It's very interesting, though. They have these plans. It seems like a good thing. seems like a kind of emergency thing to do to anoint the dead body of Jesus. But these women, it seems like they had no plan whatsoever about what they were going to do. In Mark's gospel, Mark 16, 3, it says, and they were saying to one another, because remember, they had watched Joseph and Nicodemus put Jesus's body in the tomb and, and seal it with the stone. Mark 16, 3, and the women, they were saying to one another, who will roll the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb. Seems kind enough that they want to go and anoint the body of Jesus, but they have absolutely no plan how they're actually going to execute this. You ever find yourself doing that? Just saying, well, I know what we want to do. have no idea how we're going to do it. We're just going to figure it out as we go. It seems like that's what these women did. And why do we do that? We do that because we really don't know what tomorrow holds. And if we did know what tomorrow held, we wouldn't really know what to do with it until we got in that situation. And we kind of just hope for the best. Because in the end, we're humans. And we have far less power than we really think we do. 
We have far less control over things than we think they do. And so the women, they portray that attribute of humanity perfectly here. They have no idea what they're going to do, just going to figure it out on the way. But these women can't even move the stone from the tomb, which begs a more serious question here. If these women don't even have the power to move a heavy stone from a tomb, what are they actually going to be able to do? I have to rephrase that so that you understand exactly what I'm saying here. If they don't have the power to move a heavy stone, what benefit will they be to a dead body? They can't even move a heavy rock. The most that they can do if they get access to Jesus' body is to put perfumes and ointments and spices on it so his body as it rots won't stink. That sounds awful crass, but that sure is reality, isn't it? And we look at these women and we point a finger and we say, well, that's the most you can do. But realize that it's a reality for us as well. The previous church that I pastored there in Oklahoma, we had a cemetery right next to the church. And so I got to see this up close. I would go running in the cemetery on my jogs. Right? We'd take the family and we'd go walk around and, and just uh, look around and everything like that, look at the tombstones. And, you know, you come to some tombstones, some plots, and somebody has come to that plot and they have manicured that grass finer than a golf course. You've been to a cemetery, you know exactly what I'm talking about. The grass is finely manicured. They will bring a lawnmower to mow about six square foot. They will spend money on flowers on a consistent basis and come and put flowers. And I'm not trying to be mean here or anything like that. I'm just speaking about a reality because I know some in here do that. And it's just fine. But in the end, when we take flowers to a grave, when we manicure the lawn there at the grave... What are we really accomplishing? Sure, we are creating a memorial. We're remembering that person. But in the grand scheme of things, all we're really doing is trying to beautify a bit and cover up the ugliness of death. When you think about it, that is the truth of the most that any of us can do with someone who dies. We can try to mask, cover up the ugliness of death, because death is an ugly thing. We can try to beautify their body, give them a nice suit or a nice dress, take care of them in a nice funeral home, but that's the most we can do. These women are going to do everything in their power, and the only thing in their power is to cover up the stench of death. And they wonder, how are we going to deal with death? When it hasn't crossed their mind, they're going to go to the tomb to deal with death. But Jesus is not in the tomb because he's already overcome death. He's not there for them to deal with. There is no stench to cover up because he has conquered death. There is no decay in his body because he's not there. And they get up at the crack of dawn thinking that they would beat everyone there and they would get to work and do everything that their heart desired to take care of their Lord. They're going to beat everyone there. But you know who they couldn't beat? God. God is always at work before you are. That didn't seem to excite anybody. God is always at work before you are. He is always there, and he's always making provision before you even know how to do it. He's got a plan, and he's worked it out when you say, oh, i just figure it out as I go. God is already at work, and he's already got it completed in his own plan and in his own time. God is always at work before you are. You can wake up at the crack of dawn, but you know what? God doesn't have to wake up in the deepest dark because he never went to sleep in the first place. Our God neither sleeps nor does he slumber. He never pauses. He is always at work, and he had already raised Jesus up from the dead these women thought that they would go and deal with death but Jesus had already gotten up from death there is no dealing with death when you come to Jesus because he has already overcome it so you look here at verse 2 
And it says, and they found the stone roll away from the tomb. Matthew chapter 28 verse 2 tells us that there was an earthquake that morning. That the earth shook, the heavens shook, and the grave opened up as an angel descended from heaven, put his hand on that stone, and rolled that stone away. God had already made provision before the women even got there. How are we going to move the stone? God says, don't worry about it. I've already sent an angel to take care of it before you ever figured out a solution to your issue. So the angel opens up the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Look at verse 3. Can you imagine what the women would have been thinking when they come? They see the tomb open. They felt the earthquake. Something miraculous has taken place, something seismic at least. They come. The tomb is open. What do you think they would be expecting to find as they went into the tomb? They would expect to find a dead body. What does verse 3 say? It says, but when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. His body is nowhere to be found. But I want you to notice, I want you to notice what Luke calls Jesus there at the end of verse 3. What does he call him? The Lord Jesus. If you have read through the entirety of the Gospel of Luke, if you've been following along with us over the last couple of years, what you will realize is that is the first time in the Gospel of Luke that Jesus is referred to as the Lord Jesus. When you look in the book of Acts, beginning there at the beginning of Acts, Jesus is referred to quite often by Luke and the apostles as the Lord Jesus. But this is the first time in the Gospel of Luke that he is carrying that title, the Lord Jesus. Sure, certainly the disciples have referred to him as Lord. They've called him Master. They've called him Rabboni or Rabbi, Teacher. But they have never called him the Lord Jesus. You see, that's an interesting title that Luke gives Jesus. And it's a title that bears quite a bit of significance, especially in relation to Jesus' resurrection. It's one thing to call Jesus Lord. It's another thing for Jesus to carry that title permanently. The Lord Jesus, Tonkurion, with the definite article, the. He's unique. He's the only one. He is the Lord Jesus. He is the only one in all of the universe that carries the title, the Lord. All other people who have carried the title, Lord, Master, Teacher, all of them have died and they have ceased to be called that. But Jesus is the only one who is alive and forever maintains that title. That is why Luke writes of him, the Lord Jesus. In fact, when you read in the book of Philippians chapter 2, verse 9 through 11, the apostle Paul talks about the theology of the resurrection. And he says that because of the obedience of Jesus, even to the point of death on a cross, that God has given him a particular name. Philippians 2, 9 through 11, therefore, because of his obedience in death and his resurrection, therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. What is the name that he's talking about? Is it the name of Jesus that is above every name? Be careful. Think about this. There have been many people through history named Jesus. There are people even today named Jesus. The exalted name of Jesus is not Jesus. I want you to look more closely at Philippians 2 about the exalted name of Jesus. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth, and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is what? He is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The title that God has given Jesus because of his obedience and his resurrection is Lord. Because he has conquered death, he has proven himself master even over the greatest enemy that you and I face. That is sin and the grave. He is Lord over the universe from which he created and he is also Lord over all man. He is the Lord Jesus. You don't have to ask Jesus to be the Lord of your life. Jesus is the Lord of your life. It is preposterous 
dangerous for somebody to pray in their heart, Lord, would you be the Lord of my life? You don't have to give him that title. He's already inherited it. In fact, every being, every human being that has been created or will be created will acknowledge the title of Jesus, that he is Lord. Even those who do not believe in his name, when they die and they kneel before Jesus, they will declare that he is Lord. That is a unique title that he alone bears because of his obedience and because of his resurrection. He is the Lord Jesus. Very interesting that Luke calls him that now, at this point, immediately after Jesus has been raised from the dead. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus, verse 3. Verse 4 says, while they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. That word for dazzling is actually literally the word for lightning. It's the best that these ladies could describe. It's the best description Luke could come up with, that their clothes, their clothes look like flashes of lightning. These are the garments of heaven. The most mundane things in heaven are the most powerful things on earth. They are clothed in lightning, dazzling apparel, the glories of heaven. Two men stood by them in lightning apparel, dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, that's the appropriate posture, isn't it, of a human being before the glories of heaven. It is to humble yourself, to bow your head. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? Why do you seek the living among the dead? That's an interesting question, very important question, in fact. Think about it on a very elementary level here. There are many people who try to seek life among dead things. Many people that try to find fulfillment in life, try to find a happy life, try to find their, quote, best life now, in this life, pursuing after dead things. They want to find fulfillment in sex. They want to find fulfillment in drugs in alcohol, in money, in success, all of these things that will die with this body. All of these things that are very fleeting and temporary pleasure, all of these things that once they are enjoyed, they leave you. Why do you seek the living among the dead? That's a foolish thing to do. But that's not at all the point of the question there. It just bared mentioning. The angel says, why do you seek the living among the dead? When those women came to the tomb, saw the stone rolled away, and they stooped to look in, and they find no body, what do you think was their first thought? What would logic dictate? Someone has stolen the body. Someone has taken the body. So the angel responds, and his response really is twofold. First off, it's a rebuke. Why do you look for the living among the dead? He's not here. He's risen. You're looking for a person who's alive in a tomb. He's not there. Why were you so slow to believe? You're perplexed about these things. You marvel about these things, but don't you remember don't you remember what Jesus had told you? There are many things in this life that perplex us, that trouble us, that cause us great anxiety that would not be the truth if we were so quick to believe the Lord Jesus. If we were quick to believe his word, all of our fears and anxieties would be alleviated. So he says, why do you seek the living among the dead? The second part of the answer answers the question that they didn't even ask. As they look in the tomb, they find no body. The first thought that they must have had was the body has been stolen. And yet what's the angel's response? His body has not been stolen. His body got up and walked out of here. Why do you seek the living among the dead? He's not dead. You will not find Jesus' bones next to the mythological creatures of Greek heroism. You will not find Jesus' bones next to ordinary men like Buddha. 
And you won't find Jesus' bones next to false prophets like Muhammad because Jesus' bones have flesh on them. He is living. He is walking. That's why it's not fitting to call him a prophet. That's why it's not fitting to call him a great man. That's why it's only fitting to do as Luke did and call him the Lord Jesus because he is the living ton zonta. That is a present active participle. That is a title that Luke gives. The angel says of Jesus that he is the living It's a permanent way of being. That's the way he always is now. He's never almost dying. He's never descending down into the depths of death. He is just living on and on and on and on and on. He is the living, so he is not among the dead. So he answers the question they're not even asking. No, nobody stole the body of Jesus. The body of Jesus got up and walked out. Why do you seek the living among the dead? Look at verse 6. The angel says, he is not here, but, underline that as many times as you can before crossing out the word under it. He is not here, but, that is the strongest adversative particle in the Greek language. He is not here in the grave, but he has risen. So far, as strong as this angel can say it in the tongue that they are hearing this in, he says, so far from being dead and among the dead, Jesus is alive. He's not here. He's risen. He's not here, but he has risen. Remember? Underline that, please. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise? You remember in Luke 9, 17, Matthew 16, Peter confesses Jesus, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And you remember that Jesus told him what it means to be the Christ, the Son of the living God that he must be handed over into the hands of sinful men, crucified, and then raised the third day. You remember what Peter said to him? Far be it from you, Lord. It says he pulled him aside. You don't pull Jesus aside. He pulls Jesus aside and says, far be it from you, Lord. That will never happen. And you remember Jesus' response? Get behind me, Satan, for you're not thinking of the things of God. Jesus had told them, if these women had just remembered how many of our fears and anxieties would be alleviated if we would simply remember the words of God. They would calm and quiet all of our fears, all the things that trouble us. So he says, remember. And thus Jesus has fulfilled what he promised them, that he would be crucified and then rise. Verse 8 says, and they remembered his words, and returning. And because they remembered his promise, that he had made good on his promise, they left the tomb. There's no point in being there anymore. And returning, verse 9, from the tomb, they told all these things to the 11. Remember, they are 11 now. Judas has abandoned his office. He had betrayed the Lord. And then when he saw that Jesus was going to be put to death, he regretted his decision, and he took his own life. So now they are 11. And they remembered his words, and returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Verse 10 says, by name, in fact. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. It seems like a small thing that they did. They were just going to go and anoint the body of Jesus, make this kind gesture, do the most that a human could do. And we might dismiss something like that as small, but it was, in a sense, an act of faith. Notice here that their names are written down in Scripture forever. There is no such thing as small acts of faith. God remembers everything that we do. So they are mentioned by name. So they go and they tell the 11 and those who are with them, Look at verse 11. But these words seemed an idle tale, and they did not believe them. That word for idle tale, you could translate it idle talk or nonsense. 
They, they come back to where all the apostles are, probably huddled up in some house, afraid that they're going to be put to death as well. And these women come in and they say, look, we saw these two angels at the tomb of Jesus. His body's not there. And the angels told us that he is risen. And the apostles, all together, it seems, they looked at these women and said, that's foolishness. That's crazy. That's idle talk. That is nonsense. You women got up too early. You are sleep deprived. And you've been smelling those spices way too long. You know, the chief opposing argument of the resurrection of Jesus is that his disciples stole his body. You know what is dispelled here just in that verse, in verse 11? The disciples didn't move Jesus' body. In fact, when they were told Jesus' body wasn't there, they mocked the women who told them. They said, no, there's no way his body is gone. That is foolish talk. We can't believe that. You know, if they had moved Jesus' body, don't you think they'd have said, look, we know his body's gone. We moved it. No, but the closest to Jesus, his friends, his companions, the women who had cared for them as they traveled all the way from Galilee, they are all perplexed. They don't know where Jesus is. They don't know where Jesus' body is. These words seem to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. Look at verse 12. I love this word. Underline it, please. But Peter... The apostles didn't believe. The other people in the room didn't believe. They'd seen Jesus crucified. They had seen him buried. But they didn't believe that his body was gone. They didn't believe he had risen from the dead. But Peter rose and ran. That word rose is also a, a verbal participle. It's in the aorist active, meaning it has this connotation, that as soon as Peter heard these women say these things, He got up. As soon as he heard him, it implies immediate action. He took immediate action when these women said this. He's not saying, that's babble, that's idle talk, that's nonsense. Peter rose and he ran to the tomb. Peter rose and ran to the tomb. You know, it's interesting, in John's gospel, John refers to himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. And John records that he and Peter both got up and they ran to the tomb. And I love the way that John wrote that because John said, and the disciple whom Jesus loved outran Peter. You can see a bit of the humanity of John there. I'm going to record this. On the words of eternity, so that as everyone is in heaven for the rest of all time and then some, they will remember that John was faster than Peter. (laughs) John beat Peter to the tomb. But you know what John did when he got there? He stopped. All he saw was a, a tomb door moved in the opening. But he stopped. Not so with Peter. Look at verse 12 in entirety. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen cloths by themselves, and he went home marveling at what had happened. You see, for Peter, he is intent on finding Jesus. He's not intent on just seeing the tomb. He wants to find Jesus. He is after him. Begs the question, doesn't it? Why does Peter... Why does John? But why does Peter rise and run immediately upon hearing that Jesus has been raised from the dead? Why does he rise and run to find Jesus? Why the one who ran from Jesus just a couple of days prior to this, remember that? He's in the courtyard of Caiaphas, the high priest, and he's accused three times. You're a disciple of this Galilean, of Jesus of Nazareth. No, I never met the man. And he eases himself away, finds himself at the gate there, and finally he's asked again, and he runs for his life. Why is the one who who ran from Jesus now running to Jesus? The answer's in the question. Peter is now running to Jesus precisely because he ran from Jesus. 
what sounds like a defying of all the odds, an unexpected twist of the plot here in the end gives Peter a shimmer of hope. Everyone else says, that's foolishness, that's nonsense. Peter doesn't even listen to it. He gets up, he rises, and he runs to the tomb. And you've got to be thinking, this has crossed Peter's mind. If Jesus is alive, I'm going to hunt him down and find him, and I'm going to ask him to forgive me. Because if he's alive, I have a chance to be reconciled with my Lord whom I ran from. So now, you better believe, I'm going to rise and I'm going to run to him. Because for him, because Jesus was raised from the dead, the one who had no hope now has hope. Take careful note of this because this is true of life, of all people. Those who run to Jesus are those who feel the depth of their sin. Proud people don't run to Jesus. But a man who has been debased by his own actions, a man who has been laid low by his own betrayal of the God who made him, of the Lord who loves him, he will run to the Savior when he hears that there is a glimmer of hope. So Peter rises and runs, defying all the expectations of men. Jesus is raised from the dead. And now there is hope for those who have died.